Very good. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get going uh, with this first caller. Caller, uh, welcome to the show. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Hi, this is Boas Christian and Judith from the Netherlands. And this is a question for Tovia Singer. We have read... Um, we've read? We've read that both Ezekiel and Daniel were written down by the men of Great Assembly because their prophecy was outside the land of Yitzchel. So we wondered uh, about the Torah, uh, if it is also written outside of Israel, or if it's, or if it was actually not written down until the people arrived in the land. We really like to know. Yeah, uh, thank you. We really appreciate your show. Thank you. Bye bye. All right, Rabbi, take it away. That's all thank you. Wow, really great question. Uh, the authorship of the Book of Ezra. And you're talking about Daniel. Daniel's really a very beautiful book. I hope you, the viewer, who has not read Daniel yet, it happens. I hope you'll think of me a little bit when you do. It's really very, very precious, very holy. So let's talk about the authorship of Daniel as an example. Daniel was a young man when he came to Bavel. He and his companions became higher-ups in the palace of Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was a, a real prodigy. He was, a, of course, a, a great man of God. Authorship on Daniel. So Daniel is written by two authors. The first author was the Anshe Knesagadola, who wrote Daniel chapter 1 all the way through chapter 6. Okay? What is the Anshe Knesagadola? So those words literally mean the men of the great assembly. But who were these great men? They were extraordinary people. They were a collection of prophets who lived at a very late period of time, essentially at the end of the prophetic period. And the participants were people no less than Mordechai, Zechariah, Chagai, Malachi. These were the great giants who lived at the end of the Babylonian exile and in the early part of the Persian Empire. They're called the Anshe Knesset Hagadola. As it turns out, when Israel set up its government, it called its Knesset, its parliament, it assigned 120 seats after the great Knesset, the great Knesset of 120 great, they were all prophets, all had Ruch HaKodesh, all just one after the other was, were extraordinary, extraordinary men. They were responsible for many things. This is a subject that I can really speak about for a long time, but I have a tendency to go off the rails and just go on and on, but I'm, I want to keep it really tight. They were responsible to assign which sfarim, which books remained in the canon and which were not. You know, if you read the Bible, that there were many, many more prophets than those who were are recorded, whose words are recorded in Tanakh. In reality, there are one over a million prophets in history, Kaflaim Kiyatsim Israim, which means double the amount that went out of Egypt. So it's 1.2 million prophets. We know that so many were killed out. Their writings were not recorded. Why not? They were speaking in the word of Hashem, but their words were not knit in the diaries, which means that many of the prophets were speaking only to that generation, not future generations. So the job of the Anshe Knesset Gadola, one of their roles was to make sure that only those sfarim, those works, that were both, of course, written by a prophet, and B, were relevant to all future generations, became a part of the Tanakh. And they wrote part of it. They assembled much of Tanakh. As an example, if you look at the book of Daniel alone, so the book of Daniel is 12 chapters, right? But there's really, really some very interesting distinctions between the chapters. Let me get right to the point. Daniel 1 through 6, which is so easy to read, really so yummy. So Daniel 1 through 6 is written in the third person. It was written by the Anshe Knes Hagadola by the, the men of the great assembly. It's all in the third person. 
whereas from Daniel 7, verse 1, all the way to the end is written in the first person. It was written by Daniel himself. And those two records were put together, were assembled together, and then I'm going to say a word, and they were stitched together in a very precious way. I'll show you something quite delicious in a moment. And they were stitched together. And as you said, this was a, Daniel spent his life in, in Bovel, and this was the Anche, the Anche Knesset Agadola would assemble the Sefer, the book, both their writing and Daniel's writing, and it's a, a text of two and a half thousand years old. When we speak about the book of Ezra, that's the center of your question, Ezra, as it turns out, of course, wrote his work in Eretz Israel. Ezra is only part of his work because Ezra wrote a book that's much longer than the book of Ezra. It's Ezra and Nehemiah. This will surprise many people, but Ezra and Nehemiah are really one book. is one safer, and the division is artificial, as First and Second Samuel. Ezra and Nehemiah is one safer. There really are 24 books in the Jewish Bible, but because of later fancy ideas, the divided Samuel, the divided kings, but all those divisions are completely artificial. So Ezra Nehemiah is one safer. Ezra is very precious. Is it so many reasons? I won't go into it, but you know, sometimes when you're reading Tanakh, it it could be difficult, mean painful. When I say painful, Tanakh is not a storybook, but it's very deliberate in recording very frequently you know, very difficult histories because the prophets were seeking to highlight every mistake and blunder that people made. So it's kind of skewed that way. If you ever want to read a part of Tanakh where it's really just smooth sailing and there's really just easy going, read the first six chapters of the book of Ezra and... It's just all pleasant. It's when I say pleasant, I mean that there's no. It's all. It's all good. Meaning everyone is doing what they're supposed to be doing. And in fact, we are only introduced to Ezra in the seventh chapter, and then there's going to be there are going to be some very serious challenges. Okay, so there's Ezra. Ezra also is the author of Divrei Hayomim, the book of Chronicles. Again. There's only one book of Chronicles. Ah, you see today it's Chronicles, first and second Chronicles. That's an artificial division much, much later. Ezra, the author of that work, would have never known that someone later would have divided the two, and we went along with it. Now, I want to, if I may, just, just something really, really delightful. You remember when referring to Daniel, I mentioned that the first six chapters were written by the Great Assembly, and that's why it's written in the third person about Daniel. It was written two and a half thousand years ago. No matter what they tell you, all the drivel you're going to hear in a university campuses, <laughs> they hate the book of Daniel. They'll rip it to pieces. We have actually more evidence that Daniel was written when it was written than most books in Tanakh means we have eyewitness accounts. I can't go into it now. Just whatever they're going to tell you at, uh, at the University of Chicago and at NYU and at Harvard and Yale, don't listen to them because <laughs> if you want to meet fundamentalists, forget me. Those are the fundamentalists. All right, well, let's go back. I, I mentioned that Daniel is seen together so 1 through 6 and 7 through 12 are seen together. And if you want to take two parts and really create a bond between the two parts, if you're taking two pieces of parchment, for example, and you want them to really stay together really strong, so what you might do is you might take the very edge of the parchment that ends in chapter 6 and then put that together with chapter 7, the beginning of chapter 7, and you might fold over the two before you stitch between the two pieces of parchment together. You're going to have a, a very strong bond. There's a reason why I'm sharing this with you. Listen to this. This is we're going to a very special place now. As it turns out, the book of Daniel is written in two languages. 
Now, they're sister languages, but Daniel 2, verse 4, from that point, all the way to the end of chapter 7, is in Aramaic. Aramaic is a sister language of Hebrew. When I say sister, I mean like, I'm going to say an identical twin, but they really, really look alike. You ever walk on the street and you see two sisters? Two girls standing there, and you're going, oh, it's very obvious. So, so that's what Aramaic and Hebrew are. They're not the identical language, but it's very, very similar. It's much more similar than other languages we can think of that are similar, like Lahavdil, Portuguese, and Spanish. Really very similar to the point that someone who's a Hebrew reader and looks at a, an Aramaic text would be able to make out what's going on there. Listen carefully. What's very interesting, listen, this is very intense. Chapter 7, verse 1 of Daniel, all the way to the end, chapter 12, is written by Daniel, and it's in the first person. He's speaking about himself in the first person. But chapter 7 is in Aramaic, as is chapter 6. And that's weird. It's weird because expectation is that Daniel 2, verse 4, all the way through chapter 6 and 7, they're in Aramaic. But if Daniel starts speaking in chapter 7, why is chapter 7 in Aramaic? It should switch. Just like from chapter 7, verse 1, begins with Daniel speaking in the first person, unlike the first six chapters, logically, chapter 7 should also begin in Lushan Kaidish, in Hebrew, rather than retain the Aramaic that already existed in the chapters that introduced it. This is, has perplexed scholars for a very long time, and this is something absolutely fascinating. It's really so, so delicious that you could really just, you can almost swoon when you read it and then understand it. So I, I mentioned before the metaphor of how you would stitch parchment together. You would fold them over and then sew it, and then it would be a much stronger bond. Well, listen carefully. So what's Daniel chapter 6 about? It's really quite, it's a very beautiful chapter. Let me make it easy for you. Daniel 6, you're probably familiar with, even though you may not realize it, it is the chapter that describes Daniel thrown into a den of ravenous lions. The king who was responsible for this was a reluctant king. His name was Darius the Mede. He's not the Darius the Persian, and he was king immediately after the destruction of the Babylonian Empire for a very short time before Cyrus. So from the destruction of the Babylonian Empire until Cyrus was just a short time, just a matter of months, in the interim, you have Darius the Mede. And as it turns out, he really had a tremendous fear of heaven. After the Babylonian Empire was finished, destroyed in the blink of an eye, historians to this day are, are bewildered by how something like that can happen. But the Persians were not idiots. Daniel was a genius, and he shared his wisdom, and they wanted to retain him, and they did retain him. So just as Daniel served so well to the Babylonian Empire, teaching them wisdom and time and so on. When the Persian Empire emerged, starting with me, Darius the Mede, they, they adored him. He was very well known, and they kept him. But what happened? He was one of a few people who, were in, who had enormous power, satraps, in the Persian Empire. And there were many people below him, and he had a few competitors. He wasn't the only member of Darius's inner circle, inner cabinet. And people were very jealous of him, and they wanted to destroy him. They wanted to bring him down. They were unable to find any flaw in this man. Daniel was a highly perfected person. What did they do? So they came up with a plot, which they had this, the king sign. That is, that for a time... No one in the kingdom was allowed to pray to anyone except for Darius the Mede, only to the king. You couldn't pray to anyone else. They knew that Daniel was a Kodesh and he was, he was Tohar. They knew that he was a holy man and he was a pure man. He demonstrated his loyalty to the one God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
many, many times before. So therefore, Daniel, they knew, was a godly man, and they wanted to destroy him. So an edict was signed that whoever prays to any other god but to the king will be thrown into a, a den of ravenous lions. Daniel was such an amazing person. What did he do? The Novi says, this is chapter 6 of Daniel, that he could have prayed quietly in the closet. He could have gone, I'm sure he had a very nice setup. The king took good care of him, I'm sure. But he could have closed the door, pulled down all the blinds, and then prayed quietly so he doesn't have himself killed. Not Daniel. Daniel showed us the way to survive. Logically, survival means being quiet. We should all just shut up, keep our mouth shut, and let the enemies go, and shh, we don't want to make the nations angry. We'll appease them so they don't get angry at us. Daniel's showing us that's not how to survive. It may be logically how to survive, but in reality, the only way you can survive is to publicly be a Jew. Do you hear that? What does Daniel do? This is not just a great story. This is telling you how to behave. Don't be afraid of the nations of the world. They're only impressed with a person who's devoted to Hashem publicly. They have no use for the Jews who are secular. They have a lot of respect for the religious Jew. What does Daniel do? He goes up to the tower. There's windows all over. <laughs> there's windows. Face. Everybody can see. Imagine there's a big tower with windows. Everybody can see what's going on. And he opens all the windows, and he faces Jerusalem. He gets down on his knees, and he prays to Yishlaim in public so everybody can see. Make no mistake. He made a Kiddush Hashem. In, uh, uh, he sanctified the name of Hashem in front of everybody. Could you imagine that? Again, this Darius Tamid was really quite a special person. He's not discussed a lot, and he should be. And he was very distressed by this because he really liked Daniel, and he realized what was going on, and it was beyond his ability. And there was no choice. Daniel was then thrown into a, a den of very hungry lions. And of course, the lions would eat anybody. That would be the end of you. What happened? So here's Daniel thrown into a place with wild, ferocious animals that were hungry. It's not like you served them 15 buffalo the day before, and it was so half full they couldn't. They were starving. As it turned out, Darius the Mede came the next day and he went to look inside. As it turns out, none of the animals touched Daniel. Daniel was safe from these violent, wild beasts. It's very, very important. And of course, Darius was very taken by this. So that chapter is in Aramaic. Yeah? And chapter 7 is in Aramaic, although in chapter 7... Daniel is speaking in the first person. Why doesn't it switch to Hebrew as the rest of the book of Daniel? Because Daniel 8 to 12 is in all in the holy language in Lush and Kaddish in Hebrew. So why not have seven in Hebrew? Listen, this is very, very, very special. The reason is, is because it was designed so that you could connect chapter 6 with this great Jewish man, this great man of God, was thrown into a predicament with ravenous animals around him who would ordinarily destroy him, but God watched over him, and he survived. What's chapter 7 about? Chapter 7 of Daniel contains the visions, the ecstatic visions of Daniel. And let me save you time and tell you what it says there, although I want you to read it. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel sees ravenous wild animals that are very peculiar. You have a, a lion, a wild, ferocious animal. You have the bear, you have a leopard, and then something so horrible, it's just indescribable. And the, what's the point of this? Is it like a, a show, is it a, a chapter just about funny animals? No. The point is that these are the four kingdoms that would subjugate the Jewish people who would surround the nation of Israel who would want to devour the, the B'nai Yisrael, the children of Israel. But despite that, HaKadosh Baruch, the Holy One, blessed be his name, would protect the nation of Israel all the way till the coming of Mashiach. Oh, I think you figured it out. So Daniel 6 and 7 are connected. They're stitched together. Why? 
So you should know that six and seven are very connected. This is not two books in one. No, they're stitched together in that the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, would preserve and protect those who are devoted to Hashem. And they're, they're referred to as the saintly ones in chapter seven, just as the Almighty, blessed be his holy name, protected Daniel when he was thrown into a den of ravenous animals that would have ordinarily torn him apart if God was not watching over him. Let's take that to heart, study Daniel very carefully, and that study of this holy book should bring the coming of the true Mashiach, Bimhedi Bibi Omenu, quickly in our time. Great question. Adon asher malach, kol, yetzir nivrach.